Ladies and gentlemen, Summit moderator Miles O'Brien right, of on? PBS. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We'll just bring our panelists right on out. We're on our, we're on the home stretch on the Adams for Humanity conference, and uh, we're going to sort of open the aperture a little bit, uh, dial back, uh, and go to a higher altitude. And we're going to talk about nuclear safety uh, and uh, security. We're going to go global. Uh, we're going to ask uh, some important questions. Uh, what if America led the way in reinventing nuclear? And as we think about reinventing nuclear and exporting some of this technology, what are the safety and security considerations that we need to factor into all this? We've got a, a couple of uh, pretty smart guys who can give us some insights on the political side of this and also the intricacies of nonproliferation issues, stockpile stewardship, and moderniza modernization of, of the nuclear weapons uh, uh, arsenal as well. Uh, U.S. Senator Mike Braun of Indiana, he chairs the Senate Subcommittee on Clean Air and Nuclear Safety on the EPW Committee. And Dr. William Bookless, the Principal Deputy Administrator of the National Nuclear Security Administration, which is the agency tasked with maintaining uh, and enhancing the safety, security, and effectiveness of the U.S. nuclear weapons stockpile. And in addition, oversees the uh, na nuclear Navy and innovation that occurs there, which ultimately is where it all began and where the innovation can lead uh, into civilian uh, use. Uh, speaking of that, Hyman Rickover fathered the development of Adams uh, for Peace after President Eisenhower gave that, uh, that speech to the United Nations. It began with the nuclear Navy, and then it went into commercial energy. Uh, always nuclear has been something that has carried with it tremendous possibilities and a lot of risk. Uh, so let's begin with kind of a general question. And, and it, it's, it's so general, it's kind of, I don't know where you're going to go with it, but let's give it a, give it a shot. Um, when it comes to this new age that we're in, uh, nuclear age, uh, how, do we, how do we balance the need for uh, U.S. leadership, uh, the desire to uh, be in the forefront of um, pushing technology and using uh, peaceful use of nuclear as an uh, instrument of soft power, along with the inherent risks and security concerns that go along with it. Um, Senator Braun, uh, that's a big question, but give us a couple of ideas that you are thinking about in Washington these days on this front. Great question in the sense that I've met with many energy entrepreneurs as part of the uh, committee, subcommittee I chair, the committee I'm on. Um, the one Republican that shows up at all the uh, discussions on climate uh, and uh, how are we going to generate energy and do it in a way that lowers our carbon footprint. Leadership is essential and we've got to make sure we don't lose it. We're in the process of that happening currently because I toured the Cook facility in Michigan, for instance. It is a picture of safety and things that they've done in the management of their own nuclear facility, feeling confident enough to actually apply for a 20-year extension, and I think they might go for another 20 years after that. But in general, I think there are a couple plants under construction. China, I think, is going to bring five online. So that begs the question, how do we as leaders in the industry up to this point, to where we know the technology, to where most of the world's dependence on the technology depends on us, do we leave the scene? Uh, do we vacate because we now have uh, fracking and natural gas? Uh, all I can tell you is this is going to be in the state of flux. We haven't found a way to affordably sequester carbon. Nuclear is the one where that's not an issue. We're never going to get solar and wind, especially in the short run, to be a real contributor. We're basically now changing our system from coal to natural gas and building renewables slowly to where they will peak somewhere around 50%. The rest of the world probably isn't going to pay attention to the safety factor like we always do, and which is great that we do do it. So I think we've got a, a difficult to decision to make as we're not really building any new plants, as we're actually looking at natural gas as the energy of the near term, what do we do so that we're not left out in the cold? Advanced nuclear technology, which is the subcommittee that I chair, I'm hoping that you know this is what leads us in and transition, transitions us from where we are now to where we need to be, to where we never give up on the leadership part of it. 
So let's talk about that. China and Russia in particular are pushing nuclear exportation uh, of technology and a as a way of um, bringing influence as, as they go along. Um, has the U.S. already lost its competitive edge or is it losing as we speak? I don't think we've lost it because we were the ones that created it. But it's like anything. If you put it in the closet or you don't use it, coal, for instance, is going to be gone in 5 to 15 years. I asked some of the key players in the coal arena. They will not figure out how to sequester carbon quickly enough to keep coal alive, and it's not easy to turn the switch back on. So I think the fact that we may be leading on advanced nuclear technology with what we've done here at Purdue to at least get it switched from analog to digital, you know, we need to stay in the game. And we want to make sure, and, you know, our nuclear uh, fleet, uh, not for electric generation, but for aircraft carriers and submarines, we certainly need to be in the forefront there. So, Dr. Bookus, that's a good segue uh, into your neck of the woods. Uh, you know, historically, of course, Rick Ober's nuclear navy is where the, the whole idea began. Uh, that was adapted for civilian use. To what extent is uh, the nuclear navy still leading uh, on the technology charge? And to what extent can technology that you're working on there that you may or may not be able to talk about ultimately lead to, uh, you know, true advancements in generation four nuclear power generation? Well, I can, uh, the NNSA is responsible for the naval nuclear propulsion systems for both uh, all of the submarines and for the aircraft carriers. Um, the naval reactor part of NNSA is currently working on the next generation of those propulsion systems for both uh, aircraft carriers and submarines and um, I think is leading the world in the technologies required to deliver those propulsion systems. Uh, because of the nature of their use, I can't talk about too much of the individual technological components, but what I can say is that uh, the next generation of submarine propulsion systems will be fueled once in their lifetime, in their 40-year lifetime. Well, that's, um, that's an extraordinary development. I know you can't provide details, but is that something that maybe one day could be adapted into the civilian uh, nuclear generation fleet, do you think? Yeah, I, um, I think that um, those, the individual elements of those things are going to be uh, difficult to generalize um, broadly, but, but there are some elements of that application that I think will probably make, it, make its way into the uh, civil nuclear community as we go forward. I, I know you have to be careful with your words, so I apologize. I don't mean to torture you here, but oh it, no, <laughs> it it's, uh, comes with this with the space. Understood. A, we, uh, let's, uh, Senator Braun, when we talk about incentivizing innovation, mm. uh, when you look at nuclear versus fossil fuels and renewables, renewables have subsidies, fossil fuels have all kinds of subsidies. What's the appropriate way to level the playing field a little bit for nuclear, given that you know when you're competing against frac natural gas, it's difficult. So let's look at the context of what nuclear has been like uh, from when it started to date. It's never really been competitive in the sense that subsidies, driven mostly by regulation, safety concerns, has never made it probably something we could have scaled into the future anyway, despite the issues that occurred mostly outside of the country with the safety part of it. Never solved what to do with spent fuel. Uh, that politically is not going anywhere. Uh, the only place that's wanting to do it is Yucca Mountain. There's not any state that wants to consider it passing through. So what is the role of government? I'm one that believes that if government is healthy and it's got a balance sheet and it's operating in a way that they can do some important things, they ought to be involved in like uh, research on curing diseases, uh, maybe coming up with new technology even for <coughs> energy. I can tell you as a U.S. Senator that's a finance guy, a Main Street entrepreneur that understands finance, uh, not only in the real world, but actually in government, 
we are setting ourselves up for being out of the game in a lot of things simply because we are shru uh, shrugging off trillion dollar deficits on 22 trillion in debt and have paid none of the consequences yet. I don't want to get any more political than that, but you ought to be in the biggest business in the world, I call it Federal Government Inc., in a position of strength, not weakness. So does that mean when you've got natural gas, which is paying its way, and it's out there now lowering the cost, it actually imperils uh, certain new technologies that might need that seed capital for research. Um, I don't know where it's going to lead because I do believe that we're pumping carbon. Uh, you know, I'm a conservative that has been a conservationist my entire life, and that is going to be the issue that may drive for other reasons. And advanced nuclear technology is basically the only bird in the hand that can give us the possibility of that, depending on how you can generalize it into the use of it. So there are a lot of variables right there that we mentioned. I think that uh, depending on how long the natural gas run lasts, there are some bottlenecks there in terms of pipeline capacity. Uh, the public doesn't know it, but I think it was back in 2011. We had a really cold spell. There was a Russian tanker parked off the New England coast because we were about ready to lose natural gas for electric generation because homes would have been the priority. It'll be things like that that I think drive us into what we do with nuclear technology, or maybe there'll be some other energy breakthrough with hydrogen fuel cells that get scalable. Uh, who knows? I'm a believer that the least expensive, cleanest fuel should win in the long run, and I'm feeling fairly comfortable that the energy industry itself is going to do a lot of the work uh, to get us there, more so than what I'm comfortable about us maybe uh, breaking the cost curve on health care. I've been wrestling with that for decades in my own business. That looks like it might be more difficult than what do we do with sustainable energy while removing carbon in the process. Well, I know it's hard for a Republican to get on board with something like this, but what about putting a price on carbon somehow? So I've met with uh, what I'll call them uh, energy entrepreneurs, and I love entrepreneurs across the board. That's where all the tinkering occurs when you take anything generally from the garage or the lab you know, to the marketplace. Uh, they are more ahead of the game there in willing to look at carbon pricing. That'll run into a political hot potato you know, when you're having price setting occur. And I'll tell you where we're arguing about that right now. Uh, I've got friends like Rand Paul and Pat Toomey from Pennsylvania that don't want us meddling with health care by setting guidelines and pricing. I agree with that when you've got a healthy industry that's fully embracing transparency and competition and all the things that most of us do. It's not happening in health care. Therefore, I think you need the government nudge. When it comes to if we can't figure out a way to eliminate carbon, you know, we're going to have to nudge the energy industry. I've just seen the energy entrepreneurs, the industry, way ahead of the curve, including being willing to put a price on carbon. Yeah, I think, I, you know, generally industry likes predictability more than anything, do. right? A level playing field. You're, you're a businessman. You want a level playing field and some predictability. And I know that some of these companies, you know, they might say something publicly right now, but truthfully, they could probably live with it. And right? when I put it this way, I said, do you want regulation or would you like a friendly, neutral pricing mechanism? Because it would be one of the two. You either have to have regulation to keep the air clean or, to me, pricing is probably a better way to do it, but you'll run into a hot potato there among other senators that are ideologues not ones that can see through the ideology to the practicality, if that makes sense. Well, if it were revenue neutral, maybe you could, maybe you could get there. I don't know. Yeah. What about um, tax abatement subsidies? I mean, the, the plants that are being built in Georgia now would not have happened without tax breaks. Right. Um, is that an appropriate thing? Would you push for that? You know, subsidies, um, where do you start and stop with them? Uh, it gets into crony capitalism. 
I'd love a subsidy for my distribution and logistics business. <laughs> Never could find one. Had to do it the old-fashioned way yeah. by making a profit, reinvesting, keeping a low overhead, and using a banker as your financial partner. And a banker in the real world is as good as your first mistake. Then he's gone. The federal government, since it can float this large S on the credit card, since we're a reserve currency, it changes all the rules. And I'm, I'd be one that uh, would have to really be convinced that you start using more of them. I'm not for pulling the rug out from underneath the industries that have had it as a pump primer. So, uh, Dr. Bocos, let's uh, talk about exporting this technology. Uh, we, we've heard, we had some representatives from TerraPower on some of the panels here. Of course, TerraPower with a, with a, a new idea, a Gen 4 idea, <clears throat> uh, sodium uh, reactor, had intended to build uh, one, the first one in China, and that is now go not going to happen. First of all, that decision, um, appropriate decision in your view? I think the, uh, the analysis was that it was um, going to be a transfer of technology that we couldn't guarantee wouldn't be, would be um, properly protected mm -hmm. by the Chinese partner. So it sounds like you would agree with that. I, I, I agree yeah. with it. Yeah. So now as TerraPower looks for other places to, to build this prototype reactor, Possibly it could happen here in the United States, but it might happen elsewhere. There might be some other country that might be interested in this. What are the concerns that you and the NNS NNSA would have as something like that is exported uh, across the border? Well, uh, so in general, the NNSA is the government's arm for analyzing uh, the, the nature of nuclear technology export and, and to uh, assure that when the technology is exported, that the proper safeguards are put in place to assure that the materials or the technology aren't diverted for uh, weapons use, for military use. <clears throat> and so that's part of our commitment in the nation to uh, the, the Atoms for Peace a deal that was made under the Eisenhower administration, that we would make nuclear technology available around the world in exchange for an agreement that those countries that uh, were recipients of that technology, that uh, nuclear power capability, would not then turn into nuclear proliferant nations. So a, a big part of your job as well, is, and this is a little divergent from talking about um, civilian nuclear uh, energy production, is stockpile stewardship. And, and there's, it's worth a few words on that because that gets into this whole area of, ultimately gets into um, testing, nonproliferation issues. Right now, um, is enough money being spent on, on making sure that the, the, the nuclear weapons that we have in the U.S. arsenal are secure and safe? Oh, yeah, we, uh, that is uh, an essential part of what we do in the stockpile stewardship program, that uh, we assure that they are safe, secure, and effective. And um, a deterrent is only as good as people believe it's effective. If there are safety or security issues, that undermines the value of the deterrent. So we use, I mean, safety and security are integral parts of the way we both design and support the uh, nation's stockpile. We worry about security at our sites. Um, we had some discussions a bit earlier about Los Alamos. Uh, we worry about safety and security at Los Alamos very um, strongly. Uh, we worry about that at the uh, other labs in the plants that, we, uh, that are part of the nuclear security enterprise. Now, right above your head here is a depiction of uh, the latest uh, supercomputer that NNSA will be deploying, El Capitan, which gives you a lot of insights not only into what's going on with the stockpile, but also makes it unnecessary to do a lot of testing. Um, is, is that an accurate statement, first of all? And what, what is this going to do for you? Well, uh, it, El Capitan will be the first uh, exascale computer within the NNSA enterprise. Uh, the first one will actually be at Oak Ridge in uh, uh, 
the other part of the Department of Energy, but El Capitan will be the first one that's dedicated to national security um, mission <coughs> space. And uh, it's essential for enabling us to do much more complex, three-dimensional, full physics simulations of, uh, uh, of the pieces of the U.S. nuclear stockpile. It allows us to um, make better risk-informed decisions on the changes that we have to make in the stockpile as it ages. Um, I think something that perhaps people don't fully appreciate is that a nuclear weapon is a collection of materials, just like your car is, and um, if you don't, we don't use the nuclear weapons, thankfully, They're, but they do age. Um, there are materials in there that age, and we have to address that aging um, through, stock, through uh, life extension programs and uh, perhaps in um, full replacement at some point in time. So exaflop, by the way, 1.5 exaflops is 1.5 quintillion calculations per mm -hmm. second. Yeah, it's, I'm, not, I'm uh, not even sure what that means. <laughs> um, it, it's a lot faster than your phone. <laughs> so um, how concerned, Senator, uh, and I know this isn't necessarily right in your wheelhouse, though, but how concerned should we be, be, be long-term about the security and the safeguards around the, the nuclear arsenal? So I think that, along with the uh, security and safety of anything nuclear in the long run, uh, is one of the things that kind of puts a wet blanket on having more of it. Um, you know, I look at the electric generation fleet, you know, we really not solved that. It's sitting there in kind of temporary storage. So uh, when it comes to our nuclear arsenal, I don't know a lot about it. I think you mentioned that things age. And uh, I think that uh, I feel good, though, that we're not going to lapse on that, even if we're not doing some of the other things you'd uh, hope our federal government would do. Uh, I think there's always, even within the context of what you do with the federal government, its capabilities, its power, uh, there are always priorities that I think uh, are going to be in place. And I personally, and I don't think there would be too many senators that would think that we're even nearing the point where that is an issue. I think that my concern is more what do we do to go into the next age when you use nuclear technology vis-a-vis -vis what we see happening with China and Russia and others. So, Well, how much do you think, you know, we're kind of talking about two separate things yep. on two tracks here. How much do you think they're linked, though? And to what extent uh, does the concern about proliferation and the concerns about the stockpile, et cetera, hinder the ability of uh, nuclear energy to become more common? I mean, until there would be a solution or something that you could say, absolutely, it's not an issue. Uh, to me, it is always going to be something that uh, is going to make one hesitate to scale it to where, you know, it would be, say, you're, uh, uh, something you could take out of play completely. I, I don't know that we'll, uh, we can solve that until there was... Uh, something maybe that would arise from technology or a method to do it that we don't know about yet. Dr. Bookus, are you, are you convinced there are technological solutions that make it possible to do both? To, uh, I think there are technological solutions that if, if the uh, nations of the world continue to desire an international norm where proliferation is not desired, then I think there are technological me mechanisms to achieve that goal. I think, however, our concern is that other, some, I think we believe that the United States is at the forefront of international safeguards on nuclear technology. That is, assure, trying to assure that um, nuclear technologies aren't diverted for military use. And for that reason, we need to be in the game, regardless. Right. And I agree with that. I think, however, 
it, it puts an additional challenge on U.S. technologies when other nations are uh, potentially ready to export technologies with less attention to the to those international safeguard norms. Right. In other words, we might be playing by a different set of rules. At some level. Yeah. So should we be concerned then, as we see Russia and China aggressively try to export their technology? And what would the concerns be? We should be concerned, but what do we do? I mean, you've got China, for instance, who I'd be most concerned about because they've clearly got an economy that can put oomph behind whatever they want to do. Russia is going to be constrained by its economy and by the same reasons it broke up the Soviet Union. I don't think the mischief will ever disappear. But China, uh, to me, would be the juggernaut that we all have to be aware of that, to me, uh, you know, has gotten really good, even the Politburo, knowing that state capitalism really works. Uh, remember, the Politburo is running the political side of life, too. And I think that that's the thing that scares me. Uh, but they're a sovereign nation. And I think if they want to fully integrate into the world scene, they're going to have to navigate through their behavior issues currently that involve tariffs and forced technology transfers like you were talking about, intellectual property theft, uh, creating these huge gluts which come from a command style economy like in steel. And if they don't change, it may be their undoing because they may not be able to grow their economy to where they could really be a master with no one even able to thwart them. So who knows how that will play out. And I think uh, for their own uh, sake, I'm hoping they try to integrate into the behavior norms of what all other countries do. You're talking about where would you take that certain technology and it didn't go to China because you were fearful of it. I'd say India would be a place where you've got a lot of the issues of bad air quality, a huge potential economy. You know, I would trust a country like that. Uh, China has exhibited behavior uh, if they ever became a reserve currency, for instance, which again, I don't think they will until they liberate their political system. A lot of different variables out there. Uh, they do make me worry about how they're going to participate on all these issues in the long run. And I think we'll see all that crystallize over the next two or three decades. Dr. Bookus, when you, when you talk about Russia, of course, a lot of us would think about Chernobyl and the, and the technology of that particular reactor design. They're, they're not going to be exporting uh, with, without uh, consideration of things like containment structures, I presume, right? I would assume they would. I, I assume a recipient country wouldn't want <laughs> to import would hope, right? a technology that had safety concerns like that. I think the U.S. Uh, history in reactor safely, safety is uh, the standard in the world, I believe. Um, I think that our technologies are, are uh, considered robust. Um, and by the way, I think we lead the world in trying to assure that things like enriched uranium, highly enriched uranium, are being removed from, from sites around the world. We've removed highly enriched uranium from 100 different locations, either through closure of research reactors or conversion of research reactors to uh, a low enriched uranium, including, by the way, the, the Purdue reactor in 2007 was converted from high, highly enriched to low enriched uranium, again, to try to create an environment where proliferation was much harder to accomplish. It, it, stopping proliferation is not an easy thing. Is it, it is not. Um, as we found with uh, India, Pakistan, and now North Korea. Right. But creating an environment where it doesn't spread is the goal of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And, now, and, our, and we believe we have responsibility to support that. 
And meanwhile, the, the U.S. has been modernizing its uh, nuclear uh, weapons uh, arsenal. Tell us a little bit about that in, in particular. This is, this is the W76-2, which is the next version of Trident. So, but tell, tell us what's going on in that front, just a few words. Well, uh, so in general, um, our nuclear deterrent, both the delivery systems and the warheads, are very old. Um, the, the Minuteman III missile, which has the uh, W-78 and the W-87 warheads, um, that missile is 50 years old. Mm. Um, you know, we're, the Air Force has a plan to replace that missile. The same with the, uh, uh, the D-5 missile on the Ohio-class submarines that are being replaced by a Columbia-class submarine. And the, uh, the Air Force is also uh, putting in place the B-21 bomber. Um, the warheads date with the original delivery system developments. In the past, those systems were developed in concert. And so the, uh, the Navy is looking at uh, the next Navy warhead as a concept right now, it's not a, not a plan, but um, the uh, Air Force is also looking at the W87-1 um, and the uh, W80-4. And the, uh, as you mentioned, we just went through an extensive uh, W76-1 life extension program that was just completed. And uh, the Nuclear Posture Review called for a a low yield uh, W76 2 warhead. Now, you mentioned low yield. Uh, that is uh, a controversial thing because some people say that kind of lowers the bar to a, a nuclear uh, conflict. Uh, what are your thoughts on that one? The uh, Nuclear Posture Review uh, went through a very thoughtful process at the beginning of this administration. Um, that's done about every eight or ten years, um, and the determination they made was that in an overall deterrent sense, um, if we had only a high yield option, it, we, our deterrent, the deterrent effect would be lessened. So having a low yield option uh, for the uh, submarine launched um, ballistic missile would be an enhancement to its deterrent value. Senator, do you have thoughts on that one, on, on whether the lower yield like increases the risk here? I know we're getting far afield, but go ahead. I don't know much yeah. technically about yeah. that, but I think uh, anything that would lower the bar uh, would create a risk that we don't want to do in general because there's enough uh, anxiety out there about that yeah. kind of dynamic anyway. So uh, I would yield uh, your expertise on it, but uh, if in fact that uh, would create a risk for it, I think it would be something that we ought to avoid. How concerned, and you know, talk, talks like this probably um, make this pro potential problem worse, but to the extent that the general public conflates these issues, weapons and, and civilian use of nuclear power. To what extent does that hinder uh, the, the growth of nuclear power as, as a way of uh, feeding our needs for electricity carbon free? I think you'd lose the conflation quickly if you all of a sudden took advanced nuclear technology and parlayed it into a safe, uh, expandable, uh, way to uh, fill the void of how you're going to start to eliminate carbon. And I, I think those are two separate issues. Uh, I think if you really did that in a way that uh, was safe, uh, secure, uh, and get rid of all the issues of um, transport and storage, you'd find that you'd have a lot of people on board. Uh, I think it's the general stigma of Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, uh, Fukushima, and that's out there. And then it's always the stigma of what it was like back in the 50s and 60s when the nuclear arsenal was built 
for nefarious purposes. So you've got one that I feel comfortable. Uh, I just visited Israel, for instance, uh, spent a week there. And if you'd want to take a microcosm of how a country has to live to be on guard, to where you not only have uh, the nuclear concern uh, and somebody wanting to get it in the neighborhood, you've got the day-to-day fear. You've got the Iron Dome technology that went into place. I believe there's going to, and even with China and Russia, uh, if they ever it came on board to the extent you, that you felt comfortable with them, allied with the U.S., I think you could almost eliminate, never completely, but at least the anxiety portion of the nuclear arsenal. And I think whatever we can do over the next 15, 20, 30 years with advanced nuclear technology for um, electric generation, uh, that will assuage the concerns you might have on the other issue. And it's, a, it's a lot of variables interplaying. Would you go along with that, Dr. Buckless? Yeah, I, I, I personally believe that uh, they're, they're truly separable issues. I think that if as long as we are attentive to the proliferation implications of nuclear energy, I think we can eliminate, or not eliminate, but, but, but address the, the difference between having a nuclear deterrent and having nuclear energy. I think Japan has had nuclear energy for a very long time and have chosen not to be a proliferant nation. And I think many other countries around the world want the advantages of nuclear power, not only the, uh, um, for carbon reduction, but simply for reliable power. And it is a very reliable source of base energy. I think, uh, you know, the renewables, wind and, and solar, are extremely valuable contributions to the, to the world's energy sources, but they don't provide the base power that you need to build on with the variable power of wind and solar. So I think that the issues of proliferation and energy can be addressed robustly if we can garner the kind of cooperation with China and Russia in particular, but all nations that have uh, nuclear technology agreeing that we will manage the energy sector in a responsible way. So here in the U.S., we are closing, closing the fleet. One by one, they're shutting down. I think there are um, nine or so of them that are about to be shut down uh, in the coming years. There's already been a, a, quite a few, a handful of them. One of the issues that comes up is the waste issue, which we touched on briefly. And in many cases, these pla places get decommissioned and scraped clean, and yet there remain you know, a couple of dozen casks surrounded by razor ribbon under guard because there's no place to put uh, this waste. A couple thoughts on that. And one of the ideas is to come up with interim storage facilities uh, with the idea that some of these Generation 4 technologies might actually use the waste as fuel. Uh, Senator, is, is, that a, is that a good kind of middle ground idea? I mean, Yucca Mountain seems like a non-starter still. Uh, is it possible to imagine interim storage, at least consolidating it in some fashion? I mean, I guess you could imagine it. Uh, we did discuss that in one uh, of the committee hearings and spent some time on it, and there was no one that could come up with how you would do that. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly uh, everybody's interested in doing it, they just don't want it in their state. And that is reciprocal among every state. So um, I think you'd have to maybe see what happens with the current push on make, eliminating that as a long-term issue. And then if you got to where those were viable, then I think you'd have the ability to maybe place some of them near where the storage sites are, and you could uh, safely use some of the spent fuel in a way to where you get it down to a level where then maybe you take it to a depository. But currently, um, I can't think of any 
state's delegation of senators and representatives that would be pushing uh, to be one that would do it. So that, that's a big stumbling block as, a big as stumbling we march block. forward. Uh, but I think we've all conceded here uh, over the past few days that nuclear is pretty essential if you want to get serious yeah. about climate change. So um, wh what's, your, what's your idea? Where do we go from here? To well, my idea would be along the lines of what I just said. We keep pushing ahead on yeah. a way to uh, move the technology that we know might work. So in other words, if, you, if, if we knew there was a Gen 4 plant, a prototype being built, then yes. you could say, okay, this is going to actually use the waste. Let's put the waste here. Exactly. And, and do it in a you way where be, you... That would fly? You know, I think that would fly yeah. you know, because what else are you going to do with the waste? Right. And here's a practical way to use it up and test it. And uh, if it works without any complications, you could at least, you know, work the... Uh, danger of that stored fuel down to a point where you can maybe do a, a more comprehensive uh, cure to the issue. But in the meantime, that's why I think we've got to be in the game uh, and keep pushing forward. And hopefully we'll lead on that as we're decommissioning, you know, the energy fleet. Uh, and I think that decommissioning, like the Cook plant in Michigan, you know, they uh, are going to extend into another 20-year permit. And I asked them, uh, would you, uh, and do you have the ability to, in terms of the cost, do that last extension to 80 before the plant is, uh, you know, obsolete? And they said they're not ruling that out. So, are you reasonably optimistic about the future of nuclear power in this country? I am, I am, because I think that uh, the driver will be carbon, and uh, I, I think that uh, you know, it. There's nothing else out there that uh, you know, addresses that variable, and you can't solve it uh, through solar and wind. Everybody I've talked to, they don't think that can practically ever get above, most likely 40%, 50% would be knocking it out of the park. Uh, you've got all kinds of issues with, are you gonna clutter the landscape with uh, windmills and solar panels? I think every uh, additional acre or hundreds of acres that you do there, you're gonna get marginally disproportionate disgust with it. It's even occurring in Indiana right now where many counties want no more wind farms. So that's why I think nuclear is gonna be alive. Dr. Buchos, are you an optimist when it comes to nuclear power generation in this country? I think it's a, uh, it's a mature technology that has a lot of promise for, for the world, I, I hope it will continue to evolve in a way that can make it acceptable financially. That's, to me, the financial issue is the largest obstacle for U.S. nuclear right now. It's, uh, I will defer to the senator for the waste, uh, the political nature of, of, the, of the handling the waste, yeah. but the Future, the further development of nuclear power in this country right now is hampered by the fact that I think it's hard for people to find funding to continue to grow the nuclear industry. And we talked about it earlier, would you be willing to subsidize? To me, then it becomes a national security issue that you're not in the game. And then that all of a sudden changes the whole dynamic of national security versus just energy. And then you'll get a lot of coming together of disparate parties to where that might drive it. All right, Senator Mike Braun, Dr. Bill Buchlis, thank you both for that uh, wide-ranging discussion. We do appreciate it. I think a lot of what you um, have been talking about here is, uh, and by the way, give him a round of applause for being here. Um, much, much of what we've been discussing here is there's a generational component to it. I'm gonna shift gears after we change the seats here and we're gonna take a look at a new generation of nuclear engineers and what they are bringing to the table. One of whom uh, you've seen on the stage here yesterday and who we met when we were doing a film for Nova a couple of years ago called The Nuclear Option. Uh, meet Leslie Dewan. Do you have to worry about free flooring formation? 
Leslie Dewan is one of the young entrepreneurs leading this revolution. Yeah, because that's what I'm hoping. It's a new generation with a different outlook. Atomic power doesn't carry the same stigma for them. They are more concerned about powering the planet while addressing climate change. All of this led Leslie to MIT to study nuclear engineering. This is a general trend around the world. She was a grad student on the day the tsunami hit Fukushima. It was especially shocking to me because when I first heard the news, I thought there are overblown media reports, but I trust that everything will be okay. But it went orders of magnitude beyond what I had thought the worst case scenario accident was going to be. And yet she didn't waver in her goal to build a new kind of nuclear power plant. It made me want to work even harder on developing newer types of reactors that don't have the same cooling requirements and that are even more robust in the case of even more extreme accident scenarios. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's bring out Leslie Dewan along with Jackie Kempfer, and let's do some uh, summit takeaways. Come on up, ladies. Well, um, make yourself comfortable. Uh, Let's, uh, I'm sure all of you last night spent all seven hours watching the CNN uh, Climate Change Forum, right? You saw it all. Well, we'll give you a, a couple, of, you know, how much um, did nuclear come into play and how did nuclear get treated during all of that? Um, let's start off with a little clip with um, a response from Senator Warren. Hey. So my question is, what is your opinion on the prospect of nuclear energy to help replace fossil fuels? And uh, what do the uh, risks outweigh any potential benefits? So you rightly point out about nuclear energy. It's not carbon-based, but the problem is it's got a lot of risks associated with it, particularly the risks associated with the spent fuel rods, that nobody can figure out how we're going to store these things for the next bazillion years. So here's how I see it. In my administration, we're not going to build any new nuclear power plants. And we are going to start weaning ourselves off nuclear energy and replacing it with renewable fuels over, we're going to get it all done by 2035, but I hope we're getting it done faster than that. That's the plan. Mm. All right. So you bet. There was Thank a fair you. amount of that. Bernie no, Sanders, of course, well known uh, for his positions on nuclear power. Look at the tweet storm that followed all this. Uh, Bernie Sanders is right about the dangers of nuclear power, says uh, the woman in the upper left. Got into a fight with this other guy. Uh, Senator uh, Sanders' answers on nuclear is bad. Nuclear reactors are safe. The comparison to Chernobyl is ridiculous. Nuclear is mostly a cost problem, not a waste problem, et cetera. So uh, there was that. And meanwhile, uh, President Trump <laughs> was rolling back the Obama-era incandescent light bulb standards, which encouraged LEDs. I guess we're going back to whale oil now. I don't know. It could be kind of smelly. Uh, so anyway, ladies, uh, Leslie, when, when you, um, uh, yesterday I, brought, I put up a chart, which came from Forbes, which indicated that a lot of the Democratic uh, candidates were voicing some support for nuclear, but then, you know, we saw last night, which it, it kind of went in, in another direction. Uh, what is it going to take to change that? It was, it was surprising to me to see what Senator Warren said about nuclear last night, because I had... I believe so strongly that you need this all of the above approach. You need a diversified set of carbon free energy options if you want um, if you want to get the world off of fossil fuels. And it's it's certainly something that's very tricky politically to bring people on board with. And I think that I Honestly, I'd love to get Jackie's take on it. I mean, my yeah. my thought is just it it's going to be a longer conversation. It's going to be telling people not just what nuclear is right now, not just the existing fleet, but also telling people what the new types of advanced reactor technologies are. I think the candidates that understand and appreciate nuclear power, in particular um, Cory Booker and, and Yang, all understand what the advanced fleet is. So I think that's the key. Yeah, is that, is that what's missing, Jackie? You think that there's, they're judging it by virtue of, you know, early generation two reactors as opposed to considering that technology has come a long way. We just haven't built it, but the technology has come a long way. It seems like Booker and Yang get it. You know, I think we're at a really interesting point um, in the development of 
climate plans in this, in this campaign season that we're in, um, where there's sort of a fight to be, to see who can seem the most ambitious, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I'm all for ambition, but you know, you mentioned Bernie Sanders' plan that came out, $16 trillion plan. Um, you know, Elizabeth Warren's now taken on quite a few components of, of Jay Inslee's plan. Um, but there's a difference. You can be ambitious, but you also have to be serious. And any climate plan that comes out that doesn't basically provide all the options you could possibly get, all the carbon-free options are on the table, to get us to zero net emissions by 2050 is not a serious plan. So any plan that's constraining our carbon-free options instead of expanding them is very difficult to take seriously. So it was, again, upsetting. I was watching the, well, not all seven hours, but a pretty <laughs> large portion of the climate forum last night. And it was upsetting to see, uh, to see Elizabeth Warren take that position. Um, now, getting to your question, you know, I think that there are, there is a knowledge gap um, with, with policymakers on, on advanced nuclear.